Hi, everyone. It's Reverend Laurie with Unity of Ocala for our weekly midweek love notes for Wednesday, December 8th. No, let's see. 7th, 6th, 7th, 8th. For the 9th. <laughs> That's right. Hanukkah starts on Thursday this week. I love Hanukkah. I love this whole season and how these wonderful holidays just weave together and make for a truly magical season. And each year, for years and years, my family have lit the Hanukkah candles and told the story. And I love to bake up and fry all the wonderful dishes. Our favorite is donuts. We use um, a nice clean oil to fry our donuts in. But it's the time of the miracle of light and the miracle of the oil. So Jewish dishes that are traditionally, traditionally fried in oil and made with oil are really in abundance during the time of Hanukkah. And it's an eight day celebration. This Sunday, I'm gonna tell a lot more about the Hanukkah story, how it came into being and what it represents spiritually for us and how we can bring that light of Hanukkah and of blessings into our own realm and use it to propel us to possibilities we may not have seen before. And boy, do we all need a lot of light. So we're going to talk about that in depth on Sunday during service. But each year, starting tomorrow night, we will light the first candle on the menorah. I have my big silver menorah at the church because we're going to be celebrating it there as well. But here's one that one of my congregants gave me many years ago. It's an older one and I just love it. I use birthday candles. These are actually Hanukkah candles, but I filled it in with a few birthday candles as well. And when we light the Hanukkah candles, we light it in the direction that we read Torah and that is from right to left. So we will begin with the farthest to the right candle and then each night at sundown, we will light a different one. Kinsley is gonna help me, of course. Now, part of this celebration involves giving gifts to the children for every night of the eight day celebration. And we, we did that as well, usually food gifts and fun gifts and, and gifts of light that represent nourishment and healing and prosperity. But I like to do something a little different as well because every year I take this time to think about a couple of things. First, certain people throughout the year that have really blessed me with their light. I give them a call or I might send them a text or a special Christmas card and just tell them about the light they have shown for me during this time. And I'll pick eight people to do each day of Hanukkah to do that with. But I also like to go deeply within the story. And the story, just to share it with you briefly, if you don't know, the story is about the restoration of the Hebrew temple after the second destruction by the Roman Empire. Now, this is very significant for the Jewish people, especially at that time in history, when it seemed that their very essence their tradition, their culture was fading right before them. After the second dis destruction of their holy temple, you can imagine the devastation. Their temple was everything to them. It was the house of God. It was the place of the Ark of the Covenants where the promises of God were made to all of the forefathers during the Abrahamic times. It was the place of the holiest of the holy of the holy, where only the highest priest could enter. And this priest actually had to have a rope tied around him to enter into the very center of that temple, which was constructed in a way that God demanded it be constructed. And he would go into that holiest of holies. And the reason he had a rope tied to him was if something happened, and he didn't make it, perhaps he died in that chamber. No one else could enter that chamber. They would pull him out by that rope. So that space, the holiest of holies of holiest of holies could remain pure and undefiled. 
I don't know if that actually ever happened, but perhaps it did. And maybe that's why they did it. <laughs> anyway, so you can imagine the devastation throughout the whole Jewish community, their temple being devastated. That, that holy shrine, that place where they were one with God that place that was everything to them, their very life and life existence, devastated. Well, there was a family, the Maccabees, and one of the leaders of that family or that tribe, Judith Maccabee, decided to, to get together a band of Jewish people, of warriors that were ready to reclaim that rightful place back to the Hebrew people. And they did successfully with their small army. They went in and reclaimed that temple. There was so much destruction, so much devastation. The Romans had actually defiled the oil, their holy oil that they used for anointing, that they used for the sacrifices, that they used for all of their worship and their daily life. It was considered the blood and energy of God, that holy oil. And with the high holidays coming up, they didn't have time to refine any more oil for the needed ceremonies and rituals that connected them with God. They were able to find a tiny vial in the center under the destruction of the temple that contained clear, clean oil that was not tainted, but there was not nearly enough to sustain the light needed to produce more oil for the time it took, which was, I think, five or six days. Well, they began their work of refining oil, and they lit that candle or that lamp to do their work. And by a miracle, that light from that oil lasted not five, not six, not seven, lasted eight days. That's why the eight days of the miracle of light is celebrated every year. It was a miracle. It was an extraordinary experience. It was an extraordinary testimony to the faith that this little tribe had to keep going, to remember God. And what the beautiful thing was in my heart is that even during the mass movement to Babylon, even in captivity, miracles were happening. They began to realize or to evolve to the understanding that God didn't just live in that temple in Jerusalem. God indeed was with them on that journey in captivity and back. And so for all those in the Desperado, all those all over the world still have God with them. So that in itself is a miracle, don't you think? So the other thing I like to do during these eight days of contemplation and blessings and lighting the light and bringing the light into my home, I like to think about the dark areas of my life those caverns that I may still be in, those tunnels that I've traveled, those dark holes I've put myself in when I'm frightened. I think about that. That's part of my journey. And I think about that with a light heart. And I journal for each day of Hanukkah. I journal. What did that darkness feel like? How was it to be in it? I find many miracles when I do this type of soul searching, when I do this type of soul excavation in those dark nook and crannies. So I encourage you to join with me in that deep study over these next eight days as we journey to Bethlehem for our own rebirth. What areas were you kept in the dark? What areas did you put yourself in the darkness? Let's allow ourselves to sit in the dark for a bit. We're going to talk a lot about darkness in the upcoming days because there's power in darkness. Darkness isn't always bad. It's not always sad. And it's certainly not always scary. There's magnificent things that go on in the dark. That's what I'm going to be thinking about. I hope you do the same. Do you all remember 
First, it was a book, but then a movie was made about this woman. Her name was, is, she's still alive, Cheryl Strayed. And Cheryl Strayed was the woman in Wild. She wrote a book after her experience of the arduous Pacific Trail and her journey by herself across those mountains and deserts and what she went through and endured and what happened to her and the transformation she had. It's, a, it, it's an incredible read. If you have not read it, please read it. Cheryl Strayed, stray like a stray dog, strayed. You'll learn why she's named herself that in the book. But she also wrote a book, it's called Brave Enough. And, you know, she's one of my heroes, sheroes. Her courage, her willingness to tell her story, her openness about being in darkness and surviving, not just the Pacific Northeast Trail, but her life situations is so inspiring for me because I think it takes a lot of courage to walk this earthly journey. It takes a lot of grit and we all have that. Sometimes we forget we do and we, we tend to shy back and be little pansies but we're not pansies. We're brave women. We're brave men. We're brave children. We're brave grandparents. And we're being called that braveness in our hearts to come forward and be a shining light. So get your candles ready. Get your donuts, the dough made. Get ready to fry up some goodness. Get ready to be brave and become a beacon and a light. I love this verse of Cheryl's. She writes, we do not have the right to feel helpless. We must help ourselves and each other. After destiny has delivered what it delivers, we are responsible for our lives. <gasps> that is something to ponder over these eight days of the greatest light, the greatest light this year has seen. God bless you. Barak ato adone, melhenu nalek oholam. Bless you. I love you. I'll see you Sunday. Get your metaphysical goggles on because we're going to do some deep swimming. Love you. God loves you. Bye-bye. Shalom.